with the firm of Heiser Joy. I'm here with Brandon Curtis, also from that firm. We represent the New Mexico Oil and Gas Association, or NEMOGA, as you've heard us referred to many times throughout this hearing. We also are assisted by Dal Molenberg from Gallagher and Kennedy in Santa Fe as co-counsel. Well, who is NEMOGA? NEMOGA is the New Mexico Oil and Gas Association, and it comprises over a thousand operators who are engaged in the oil and gas business in New Mexico. And together they represent more than 90% of the total oil and gas activity in New Mexico. We've been engaged in this rulemaking since its inception, and NEMOGA has established a working group with over 80 member companies that provided expert support in many areas and participated in the process before the department. What are NEMOGA's objectives in this rulemaking and in this hearing? Well, contrary to the suggestion that may be coming across from other parties, including the department and the environmental groups, NEMOGA's suggestion is not that we do not need these rules, but rather that the rules should be crafted effectively to balance the emissions reductions while maintaining the viability of the important oil and gas industry to New Mexico. So we've been actively engaged in trying to provide proactive, cost-effective solutions and improved practices to help reduce the emissions of ozone precursors. NEMOGA has also brought to NMED's attention, and we'll bring to this board's attention during this hearing, some certain common things, such as where requirements are technically infeasible, we just can't do them, where they may be unworkable because of the way the oil field works or the particular way a requirement is phrased. We'll also address situations where the requirement may be, in our view, cost prohibitive or where the emissions benefit is trivial for the cost incurred. Finally, there are some safety issues that we believe this board should consider before it proposes to adopt certain regulations that may raise safety concerns for our workers in the field. We have also, however, proposed and agreed to a series of cost-effective solutions and best management practices that will greatly reduce emissions of ozone and nitrogen oxide precursors. And we think that that should not be overlooked as part of NEMOGA's efforts in this rulemaking. We're pleased that many of our technical feasibility and some of the workability and cost prohibitive issues were addressed in the department's September 16th, 2021 revisions. So what are going to be some of the themes that you as board members will hear throughout this testimony? The first is that this is an ozone rule and that our focus needs to remain on the statutory authority and the prevention of ozone and its health effects. We may hear things about climate change and methane, but that's really sort of peripheral to the fundamental thrust of this rule. Second, as you've already heard, this rule is different from many of those that come before this board. Many of the rules that are brought by the Environment Department are rules that have already been adopted elsewhere by the federal EPA and are being adopted and customized to New Mexico. In this case, the department, consistent with that legislative directive, is bringing a brand new rule that's breaking ground. That's good news in part, it shows New Mexico's leadership, but it also means that you as the board bear a higher burden of vetting all of those aspects of the rule to make sure that they are in fact necessary and appropriate because we don't have the benefit of a different agency already having done that in a different context. You also see that this rule is different because it's costly. You've heard that the industry expert, John Dunham's estimate is about 3.2 billion. But I note that even the NMED witnesses have conceded the cost is perhaps in the 1.5 billion range. Whether it's 1.5 or 3 billion, this is a very expensive rule compared to many that come before this board. And that means that it's appropriate to pay attention to questions where we may be able to keep effective regulation, but do so at lower cost to New Mexicans. The other thing that I think is important about this rule is that it has somewhat limited impact on those ozone levels. It's not a silver bullet that's going to solve all of New Mexico's ozone attainment issues, as much as we in industry wish it would as well. And MED's modeling that Ralph Morris will present shows the maximum impact is about 1.5 part per billion in the Northwest at one monitor location. And that's about 0.8 part per billion at best in the Southeast. And the average reduction is only about 0.8 part per billion in the Northwest, and about 0.2 part per billion in the Southeast. So we're spending a fair amount of money here for and not a lot of emissions reductions. The MOGA's witness, Dennis McNally from Alpine Geophysics, will testify that the NMED model shows the VOC controls reduce a fraction of that total ozone amount by between 0.1 and 0.3 part per billion across the state. So the VOC component of this rule in particular is troubling to NMOGA because it doesn't seem like there's a lot of bang 
for the money that the state is being asked to put into that state and industry. And Dennis McNally will also provide some overview about how the industry's ozone and VOC contributions are really fairly small in the overall picture. You heard a number of statements that we are the predominant cause of ozone formation in the state of New Mexico. And this is not true. The predominant cause is clearly transport and clearly things like biogenic VOC emissions that occur regardless of the industry's presence. And it's important to see how all the picture pieces of that puzzle fit together as you are making decisions about the future of the state. So in general, we're generally supportive of the proposals that you have from the New Mexico Environment Department, but we're asking this board to give some particular scrutiny to some of the VOC controls to make sure that they are actually going to deliver the promised benefits at reasonable cost. So let's turn then to some of the witnesses and the issues that will be before the board. First, there is a threshold issue which we heard, which is that it's not apparent to us at Namoga that Rio Arriba or Chavez County should be included in this rule. The current design value of Rio Arriba County is less than 95% of the NAX. We believe that's below the threshold established by the legislature. And that's a trend in Rio Arriba County, not just a one-time occurrence. For Chavez County, we don't believe that an adequate showing has been made that it is in fact causing or contributing are over 95% of the threshold, and we commend that to you. And you'll hear some additional testimony from Dennis McNally on that issue. Turning to the substantive provisions of the proposal, you'll see that section 113 on engines and turbines is one that of considerable concern to Namoga. This is the section that has a lot of opportunity to be very disruptive to field operations, and we want to highlight for you a couple of factors that are important to making this part of the rule very effective. The first is we need to have the ability to relocate engines and turbines as the decline in production sets in so that we don't leave overly large engines at a well site. We need to be able to move those so that we can reduce the emissions. And we're pleased that NMED in September 16th proposal has recognized this. Similarly, it's important for us that we have the ability to take engines and turbines into the shop and work on them there where we can do better maintenance than being forced to do them out in the field and NMED's newest revisions would allow that as well. We think those are very significant and important developments. We believe that the current September 16th proposals in Table 1 and Table 2 on the emissions limits represent the maximum that is currently technically and cost-effectively achievable, but we are supportive of those levels found in Tables 1 and 2. And we think that Table 3 on turbines is also very close with a couple of minor tweaks that you'll hear about from solar turbines. On the other hand, we do not agree with the National Park Service's suggestion that we should bring in all engines regardless of size and regulate them at these levels. We believe for reasons that our expert, Justin Lasowski, who is a designer and installer of these engines, that that's not possible under the design and capabilities of current technology for those smaller horsepower engines, basically those under 1,000 or 500 horsepower. And so that's important. There's also some workability issues in terms of the giant expansion in the number of affected units. So that's enough on engines and turbines. What's Namoga's next concern? We also have concern about the equipment monitoring provisions. Here, we are pleased to say that the department has moved in a very good direction, and we're down to now discussing a date and time stamp. This is in section 112. You'll hear from our expert, uh, John Smitherman, a longtime industry executive, about the difficulties in trying to integrate a new components into electronic database systems where you have to work with inherited systems already in place. But you'll hear our commitment to trying to make that work. And the only thing that we really need here is a little bit more time to achieve that work, that integration. As presently set forth by the department, they would adopt their rules in January and we're supposed to have them in place by April of the same year. If anybody's ever worked with IT, we know IT doesn't integrate that quickly. And so there will need to be a little bit more time for us to pull that off. Our third issue is storage vessels addressed in section 123. You'll see by looking at the positions of the parties that there is no or little agreement on the thresholds for existing storage vessels. What you didn't hear is that industry and the department, and I think the environmental groups are all in agreement on the two ton per year threshold for new facilities. So there is agreement on that. Why are we concerned about existing? We believe that the cost estimates that we are seeing overlook the single tank battery. And that when you look at single tanks, of which there are quite a few in New Mexico, the resulting costs are simply unacceptable 
and would drive many of those tanks out of being used and hence require shutdown of the associated facility. One of the things that you've heard from EDF and other groups is a number of academic studies where they say, well, this is achievable. Well, you will hear from Nemoga's expert, Adam Meyer, whose job is to design and install these tanks, that the costs are in fact much higher than those historic studies, which may be from 10 years ago are currently, and that many of these things are not achievable. And so we think that you will find that to be very interesting te uh, testimony. They'll also propose that by tweaking the thresholds, this board may be able to achieve the vast majority of the emissions reductions, but cut the cost by perhaps 50% or more while achieving substantially the same results. And that's why we, when we talk about crafting effective rules that are also cost effective, this will be an example of that. We also don't disagree with automatic tank gauging for new tanks. Uh, that's consistent with the OCD rules and we remain supportive of that as well. Although we're not sure that the, the NMED rules need to say the same thing as the OCD rule does. Our fourth issue is hydrocarbon liquid transfers. We're pleased that there's been good movement over the course of this discussion and that NMOGA and NMED basically have consulted and agreed on the draft that's been presented to this board. It excludes produced water, which is not a significant source of hydrocarbons, which was NMOGA's principal concern. And I think the principal concern of many of the other people that you may hear from on the industry side in this proceeding. Industry in its part has agreed to adopt a number of good operating practices to reduce the emissions from these procedures. We think this is an example of a good rule and we note that it includes beneficial provisions like not requiring pipeline facilities that pipeline their liquids to install additional controls when those aren't needed. Moving to pneumatics, we're going to be talking a lot about pneumatics. I think the board has probably already gathered that. Uh, there's little apparent agreement amongst the proposals, but I think there's actually a fair amount of actual agreement on what should be done. Industry has agreed to phase out high bleed controllers. That's part of our proposal that you'll see. Industry has agreed to the phase out of controllers on the schedule that was proposed by NMED. What our concerns are and what we ask the board to keep in mind is we need to have a program that doesn't result in surprises. And a surprise occurs if a controller failure at a facility requires us to suddenly have to try to retrofit that entire facility at one time out of its planned order. We need to preserve certain gas-based controllers for certain applications for health, safety, and process reasons where there's not a good solution. This was accepted in Colorado. We don't believe it's very controversial. And we do have a concern about the proposed line power short-term phase out because there's not adequate time in six months for us to do all of that work. And you'll hear testimony from both Mr. Smitherman, our industry executive, and also from Adam Meyer, who is our facility design and construction engineer about why it takes more time, particularly right now in the post pandemic era where supplies are short. Moving in, then you did hear that there is a distinction between industry and NMED on production percent or controller count. We have a small preference for the production based approach because it better aligns with our budgeting processes and hence is easier for us to implement. And we think that creates benefits in the long run for the state as well. Two more issues and then we'll be done with the industry position. Last of these are the next is produced water. On produced water, the initial proposal, which was a two ton per year cap, was very problematic. It could potentially stop the recycling of produced water and require industry to shift back to drinkable water or fresh water for all of its activities. We regarded this as a very big problem because industry has been committed to recycling its water and reducing its impact on freshwater resources in New Mexico. The new proposal that's been brought forward on September 16th is substantially better. Industry is in substantial agreement with it and we commend this direction for the state moving forward. On equipment leaks and fugitive emissions or LDAR that you've heard about, there's little agreement on the thresholds or frequencies for this. And we do have some problems with the general story that has been brought to this board by the environmental groups and perhaps even Occidental Petroleum. And that is that the current approach is based on studies that really represent historic industry practice, but they don't represent current industry practice and they don't reflect the waste rules that were adopted by the Oil Conservation Division. Those rules require us to have much more frequent inspection and AVO inspections, audiovisual olfactory inspections of our facility, sometimes as frequently as weekly, but never less often than monthly. And so we're on these facilities, and now we're looking specifically for those leaks. 
And we believe that these leaks are reached the level of the super emitters that you've heard about, that they will be detected by this and fixed much more rapidly than was historically been the case. This means that some of the gains that have historically been seen by Eldar may not be seen as we move into the New Mexico context. And we believe that that factor needs to be looked at and considered as we evaluate what should be the frequency for Eldar rules in New Mexico. In light of the OCD rule, Line and fence line communities and community partners, and we appreciate uh, the division's Heiser, agreement for 30 days. Mr. Heiser, I'm sorry, you froze about um, 30 seconds ago. Um, ah, was I starting a leak detection what, or where was I? Hold on, Ms. Dubois, where was he? Hopefully our court reporter hasn't froze. Ms. Dubois, I can see that you're unmuted, but we're not hearing anything from you. Um, Perhaps you could put his last few words in the chat and I'll read it. We're not hearing anything from you. Are you hearing now? Can you hear yes. me now? Yes, okay. thank you. Somehow the WebEx changed my microphone earlier and put up a message. Anyway, okay. So the last part was into the New Mexico context. We believe that factors need to be looked at as we evaluate. Perfect. Thank you, Ms. Dubois. I appreciate that. So we believe that these factors with the OCD rule and the fact that we are out weekly or monthly conducting this audio visual olfactory review suggests that there will not be issues with super emitters that are not caught and captured rapidly and that therefore the cost effectiveness estimates based on historic practices may not be accurate moving forward for New Mexico. We'd like the board to keep these factors in mind as it moves to consider the leak detection and repair requirements. In light of all of these elements, we believe the industry proposal is satisfactory and sufficient to protect our frontline and fence line communities and our community partners. In summary, members, Madam Hearing Officer, Madam Chair, and members of the board, this is a big rule. It's asking you to make substantial changes to how the oil and gas industry has worked in the past, and we're committed to working with you to achieve a good level of controls of ozone and its precursors, nitrogen oxides and volatile organic carbons moving forward. We have concerns about the extent of the volatile organic compound controls given the small benefits that and MED's own modeling tends to show in the testimony of Mr. Morris, as Mr. McNally will explain. And so we think these deserve careful scrutiny. We'd also ask the board to consider the fact that when we launch a regulation and we set those words into the law, we don't know how they're necessarily going to be interpreted. And so care needs to be executed in making sure that we don't criminalize potentially inadvertent or unavoidable occurrences in the oil field. And so there will be some cases that you see in Namoga's comments or otherwise where we express concerns about concepts like leak free or no emissions because that may not be able to be happen. And you'll hear our witnesses talk about that. And we direct your attention to that so that we don't set an unacceptable legal bar on those issues. With that, Madam Hearing Officer, Madam Chair, members of the board, that reaches the conclusion of, New of the New Mexico Oil and Gas Association's opening comments. And I appreciate your time, and I am very, very grateful for your consideration of what is going to be a long and complex hearing, and I salute you for your volunteering to do this job for the citizens of New Mexico. We are all indebted to you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mr. Heiser. 
Um, before I call on the Independent Petroleum Association, two things. Um, uh, two of the board members may have misunderstood earlier when I asked um, the panelists who are lawyers and party representatives not to share their screen unless they were speaking. Um, uh, and obviously to keep themselves uh, muted if anyone else is speaking. Uh, because we haven't seen two board members on screen whom I know have been with us from the beginning, Member Cates and uh, uh, Member Duvall, Dr. Duvall. Um, uh, Member Cates and, and Member Duvall, uh, if you have the bandwidth and are comfortable uh, being on video, we'd love to we'd love to have you join us on video. Um, uh, and if your connection becomes spotty or if you need to step away, uh, please feel free to to go dark, that's fine, but I, I didn't want to be misunderstood, so thank you. Uh, let's see, I see uh, Member Duvall now. Thank you. Uh, all right, and the other thing, sorry, that was one thing. Uh, the other thing is uh, there was a question in the chat to me from Mr. Kolklischer uh, about whether the order in which I was inviting opening statements um, uh, what the implications of the difference between the order in which I was inviting opening statements and the order in which Ms. Katz uh, reflected uh, witnesses being called in the uh, spreadsheet uh, that some of us are looking at. Um, uh, I do not, I am calling um, for opening statements roughly in the order in which we set out the service list. Um, and it does not, um, have any implications whatsoever for the uh, spreadsheet um, in which the uh, witnesses will be called and the uh, the order of the topics is set out. Uh, oh, and I see Member Garcia now on screen as well. Okay, um, that that was the two things that have come up uh, since I last spoke. So, uh, Mr. Rose, will you be? Uh, offering an opening statement for IPAMM. I will, Madam Hearing Officer, and it's appropriate. I'd like to do it now as opposed to when I called my first witness. Thank you, Madam Hearing Officer, members of the board. For the record, my name is Lewis Rose. I'm an attorney with Montgomery & Andrews here in Santa Fe, and I'm representing the Independent Petroleum Association of New Mexico which as the name implies, is comprised of independent oil and gas producers in the state. We're not, you're not dealing with vertically integrated companies. These are companies that produce oil and gas in New Mexico. It includes a number of smaller members and the membership of IPA and M is primarily comprised of producers in the Northwest part of the state, but it also represents producers throughout the state. And if I might, in terms of trying to shorten the opening statement, uh, we agree with a number of the points raised by Mr. Heiser in his opening statement concerning the effects of these rules on ambient ozone concentrations. And first, and, and I think it's important to note that, that what we're doing here is implementing a statute. It's not a new statute, as you've heard. Uh, the obligation for this board to, to assure attainment and maintenance of the ozone NACs has been, uh, been on the books since uh, the early 1970s. Specifically, in 2009, the legislature adopted provisions obligating this board when ambient ozone concentrations reach 95% of the federal national ambient air quality standards to develop a plan, and that plan was to include regulations, but it's not limited to regulations. That, that authority uh, was not executed until this proposed rulemaking. Uh, the legislature in this last session amended the act, kept the obligation of this board to develop a plan, uh, but deleted language that was de designed to assure that technology-based requirements, that is, reasonably available control technology be implemented. And where it left the board, in essence, is 
is to look at this statute in the context of other provisions in the act that is to prevent or evade air pollution and make the board aware because it's an area that hasn't been addressed by this board in some time is that this board did regulate oil and gas as one of its earliest uh, regulatory programs back in 1974 the board adopted regulations dealing with primarily with gas processors and oil refineries but also with with respect to uh, storage vessels, tanks, those kinds of things. And those regulations were in effect since that time. Uh, this board has also regulated oil and gas uh, through the permitting program, which requires air quality permits for facilities that have a potential to emit more than 25 tons per year of, of any criteria pollutant. And a number of sites within this industry, particularly compressor stations and gas processing facilities have been subject to permitting authority and requirements since the late 1970s. Um, what, what, this is, what is unique here is that you're being called upon to regulate production facilities. Most of those are below the threshold requiring a permit. A number of them are below the threshold that this board has established for notice to the department, that is the part 73 notice of intent requirements, which relate to 10 times require that any facility that emits or has the potential to emit uh, criteria pollutants in excess of 10 tons per year is required to notify the department. In that context, this is unique and is, and as I think Ms. Katz pointed out, it's something that this board has not done, at least with respect to this industry and, and probably others uh, since the very inception of the air program. I'd also like to make the board aware that when it regulated facilities under, under the Air Act to prevent or abate violations of ambient air quality standards, which the courts have said defines the levels at which air pollution occurs, the Court of Appeals very early on in 1976, and that's still the law required that, said that the board's authority, while it's required to assure that the standards are met, that its authority is to, to adopt requirements that are more, no more stringent than necessary to protect standards. And you'll hear testimony in this proceeding concerning what effects these emissions have on ambient air quality. IPNA's position is that under the statute, first, the board is obligated to make a determination on whether these sources cause or contribute to levels in excess of 95% of the ambient air quality standards. And we believe it's, it's a more difficult analysis than perhaps has been portrayed. Our analysis is that impacts of these facilities on ambient oil and on ambient and ozone concentrations, and it, in effect, does not cause or contribute to the levels that, that you're seeing in the areas of the state that exceed 95% of the, the NACs. Secondly, we believe that the statute obligates this board to establish a plan to determine how it's going to assure that the ambient air quality standards are not exceeded. Uh, the statute does not explain or give direction to this board on what needs to be in a plan. Uh, our testimony is alluded to two areas that the board could look at uh, for guidance as to what the contents of these, this plan ought to include. That is obligations for this board under section 1, 110 of the Clean Air Act to have plans to assure that ambient air quality standards are attained and maintained and also the requirements the non-attainment provisions of the Clean Air Act specify plans for areas that do not attain the ambient air quality standards, uh, particularly what needs to be in both marginal um, and other designations for exceedances of the standard. Um, you'll hear from our testimony that we believe the plan as being proposed by ED meets neither of those requirements. And finally, uh, we believe that as the statute proposes, 
that, that this is an ozone precursor rulemaking. That is, uh, you're looking at and obligated to regulate emissions of nitrogen oxides and volatile organic compounds. We believe that the testimony will, will prove that the areas we're talking about in the state are what's called NOx limiting. That is the complicated uh, chemical reaction that creates ground level ozone, which you heard about. Really in areas of this state that we're talking about are really controlled by NOx emissions. That is, if you're gonna reduce ozone concentrations, the vast majority of those reductions will be created through the reduction of NOx emissions, not VOCs. And we believe that the contribution of VOCs, uh, both to the ambient ozone concentrations and to the reductions that have been identified are minimal at best. And we believe do not justify the degree of controls that the department is proposing and others are proposing uh, on VOC emissions. We believe that if, as a result of this hearing and the testimony, you will agree with us that, that perhaps much less regulation is warranted under this provision. I warn the board to indicate that our position is fairly clear that this is not a methane rule, that the statute provides that if the department chose to regulate methane and methane emissions, or if this board does, there's provisions of this statute that need to be met and a different proceeding needs to be undertaken. As the notice of this proceeding and as the department's testimony, I think, uh, supports, this is a rulemaking designed to assure ozone concentrations do not exceed the next. And any consideration by this board as to methane reductions and predicate, decision predicated on methane reductions, we believe is in error and would be in violation of this statute. Madam Hearing Officer, that, that concludes my opening statement and we look forward to participating in this hearing. Thank you, Mr. Rose. Uh, Mr. Janot. Good morning, Madam Hearing Officer, Madam Chair, and members of the board. Oxy USA Inc. supports the goals of the department's rulemaking and appreciates the opportunity to participate in this hearing and provide practical input on the proposed rule package based on Oxy USA's experience operating in the state. Through coordination with the department and other stakeholders throughout this process, many of Oxy USA's initial concerns have been resolved. However, there are still elements of the rule that Oxy USA believes need to be clarified or otherwise addressed. Oxy USA's witness, Danny Holderman, is the asset director for the Onshore Resources and Carbon Management Delaware Basin Business Unit for Oxy USA Inc. Mr. Holderman will address each of Oxy USA's remaining issues with the proposed rule. Among other topics, Mr. Holderman will discuss the changes that Oxy USA believes should be made to the department's proposed LDAR requirements for low emitting facilities, including wellhead only facilities, and the department's proposal for pneumatic controllers. Mr. Holderman will also speak to the need to establish practical and reasonable phase in timelines for all of the department's <coughs> excuse me, proposed requirements. Oxy USA has worked with various stakeholders including the environmental NGOs. As representatives for the NGOs have noted, we provided feedback, feedback on each of their four main points. We have been able to agree to solutions in many cases that work for Oxy USA's operations with additional edits that Oxy USA will discuss during Mr. Holderman's testimony. Oxy USA's testimony only concerns what is workable and feasible for Oxy USA's operations in the state. We can't say whether it's feasible for every basin or for every other operator in the state, only what is workable and feasible for Oxy. Ultimately, Oxy USA appreciates the open dialogue and continued efforts of all stakeholders and believes that the department, the NGOs, and industry can come to agreement on reasonable and practical strategies designed to improve air quality in New Mexico while maintaining a vibrant oil and gas industry in the state. 
Madam Hearing Officer, this concludes our opening remarks. Thank you very much, Mr. Janot. Uh, Mr. Boutier, will you be making an opening statement? I will. Thank you, Madam Hearing Officer. Madam Chair, members of the Environmental Improvement Board, and Madam Hearing Officer, good morning. My name is Stuart Boutier of the Modrel Sperling Law Firm Santa Fe office. I and my co-counsel, uh, my law partner, Christina Sheehan of Modrel Sperling's Albuquerque office, as well as Whit Swift and others from the national law firm of Bracewell LLP, will be representing the Gas Compressor Association, also referred to as GCA in this proceeding. In, in my very short opening statement, I will first briefly introduce the GCA, then offer some observations about NMED's proposed rulemaking, and finally provide some basic context for the several witnesses who will be testifying for the GCA. First about the GCA. The GCA is an association whose member companies serve the oil and gas industry in New Mexico, as well as throughout the United States by providing compression services and related equipment to oil and gas producers and midstream companies. The services and equipment provided to the GCA members customers allow for the compression of natural gas to enhance its customers oil production through gas lift op operations and most commonly to aid in the transportation of its customers natural gas to and through midstream gathering and gas processing infrastructures, much of which is in remote locations. The natural gas ultimately leaves those facilities and enters into larger natural gas pipeline systems and storage facilities. As such, the GCA members serve a vital function in the New Mexico oil and gas industry and by extension, our state and local communities that benefit from GCA's and the GCA's customers' economic activities, including employment. Second, by way of general observations regarding NMED's proposed rulemaking, the GCA first and foremost commends NMED for exercising its air quality related authority to propose that EIB help address ozone precursors proactively in this proceeding, as well as in future similar rulemakings it plans to pursue involving other sectors. Even though NMED's offered exhibits suggest the primary sources of ozone precursors that have brought certain counties to within 5% of reaching non-attainment status under the federal National Ambient Air Quality Standards, or NACs, are from places outside of our state, such as Mexico and Texas, or are due to emissions generating activities outside the oil and gas sector, the GCA recognizes both the authority and general prudence of NMED in starting to offer the EIB regulatory mechanisms for getting a handle on ozone precursors to ensure our counties remain in compliance with those NACs. The GCA is not antagonistic to the general motivations behind NMED's proposed rulemaking and also is very appreciative that NMED has remained open and attempted to be responsive to reasonable input from stakeholders in the extraordinary and lengthy efforts leading up to this hearing before the EIB. In fact, Madam Hearing Officer and, and the EIB members will hear a, a number of GCA witnesses essentially endorse certain aspects of NMED's latest September 16 draft of the rulemaking as being sufficiently responsive. Finally, to provide the hearing officer and board members some context for the witnesses who the GCA will be offering in this proceeding, it might be useful to point out how the GCA has viewed its role in similar proceedings that have occurred at the federal level as well as in other states, because the GCA offers its several witnesses in the same spirit here. That is, it offers its witnesses in a spirit of cooperation 
by lending their technical expertise and expert familiarity with some of the engines and other forms of equipment and processes that are the subject of various aspects of NMED's proposed rulemaking so that the EIB will be well positioned to balance important policy considerations, avoid arbitrary decision making, and ultimately do what's best for the citizens of our state. The GCA has its own environmental committee chaired at one time or another by two of the witnesses we will be offering in this proceeding. A key goal of that committee, as well as the GCA itself, is education, both of its member companies to help ensure compliance with applicable law and to provide regulators with the necessary insights to be able to make reasoned choices and ultimately to adopt reasonable and balanced regulations addressing this complex and highly technical area of the law. The GCI, GCA thanks NMED's counsel and the Madam Hearing Officer for the efforts already made to sensibly organize this proceeding and thanks the EIB members in advance for their attention and diligence in the coming weeks as it considers and addresses these issues of great importance to the citizens of New Mexico. With that, I will yield this virtual platform to whomever may be next. Thank you, Mr. Bootsy. Mr. Gu Ms. Gutierrez, will you be offering an opening statement for Kinder Morgan? Thank you, Madam Hearing Officer. Yes, I will. And might I ask you provide me permissions to screen share? Yes, just a moment. Thank you. You should have that privilege now. Do you see on your screen a PowerPoint? Yes. Okay. Relocate that screen. Okay. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board, Madam Hearing Officer Orth, Board, board Administrator Jones, New Mexico Environment Department, and other parties. My name is Ana Gutierrez with Hogan Levels, and I am representing Kinder Morgan Inc. and its subsidiaries and affiliates, El Paso Natural Gas Company, Trans Colorado Gas Transmission Company, and Natural Gas Pipeline Company of America. Throughout this hearing, I'll be referring to this collective group of companies as Kinder Morgan, because that's a mouthful, <laughs> and each of our technical witnesses will also refer to the companies collectively as Kinder Morgan. Thank you for the opportunity to present an opening statement to you today, and I look forward to engaging on these important issues. As far as an agenda for this presentation, I'm going to spend most of my time providing an introduction to Kinder Morgan and their operations in New Mexico. Dovetailing on that, I'd like to then describe the uniqueness of the transmission segment of the natural gas supply chain. Next, I want to spend just a brief bit of time framing the discussion that, will we will, that we will be having over the course of the next two weeks. And then I'll end by identifying the priority issues for which Kinder Morgan is asking the board's support. While it was not on my agenda that I just walked through, we do just want to take a brief moment to thank the department in particular and hearing officer Orth and the other parties for their work in developing a really robust record for the board's consideration. And we want to thank the board for diving into all that work in preparation for this hearing. So let's let's jump right in. Hinder Morgan transports natural gas in a safe, efficient and environmentally responsible manner for the benefit of individuals, communities and businesses. In New Mexico, Kinder Morgan operates approximately 3,595 miles of transmission pipeline, and it owns assets in 23 counties throughout the state, including in counties that are the subject of the proposed rules. Kinder Morgan is an important member of the New Mexico community. The company employs approximately 180 individuals, maintains a payroll of over $16.6 million, and pays approximately $8.8 .8 million annually to local and state taxing bodies. 
This slide here just provides a visual of the role that Kinder Morgan plays in our communities. The company delivers affordable and dispatchable pipeline quality natural gas, both to industrial users and to local distribution companies. The local distribution companies are the city gates for natural gas to be delivered to each of our homes for use in heating, stoves, water heater, all of our daily uses. Kinder Morgan operates in what is referred to as the transmission segment of the oil and gas industry. And I wanna give context to that and talk about what makes this segment unique and what distinguishes it from other oil and gas operations. You will see this slide a couple of times throughout our presentation presentations, and it's intended to help orient us. What this depicts is the entire natural gas system supply chain. And we show this because it's important to understand where Kinder Morgan Kinder Morgan's operations take place in this sequence. Transmission compression compressor stations are identified as number six on this schematic. Upstream operations, which are identified as numbers one and two, are where the product is extracted. The raw product is then moved by the midstream gathering and boosting segment, numbers three and four, through to the natural gas processing plant, number five. Because of where we sit along the supply chain, Kinder Morgan's operations are distinct in a number of ways. Let's walk through some of those distinctions. First, the company transports pipeline quality natural gas. This is referred to as sweet natural gas, and it has already been processed at the natural gas processing plant, which means that the natural gas has a much lower BOC content than the gas that is produced, transported, and processed at well sites, gathering and boosting stations, and natural gas processing plants. To illustrate this point, this slide summarizes a data set that we analyzed. The full data set is available at attachment B to the Kinder Morgan direct testimony. This data was gathered over the past year from gas chromatographs. Kinder Morgan operates somewhere around 40 gas chromatographs chromatographs in New Mexico that continue to continuously monitor the natural gas. These chromatographs take about two to three samples every hour, which are then averaged to give one numerical block hour average. The reason they monitor the gas so closely is because these are FERC regulated pipelines. So the company is required by FERC to have certain gas composition for delivery to end users. You will see in this chart that the average annual VOC content at all five stations evaluated is less than 1% and can be as low as 0.206% VOC. In contrast, the VOC content of the gas processed and moved through upstream and midstream operations is typically much higher depending on operation and location. Another critical distinction is that day-to-day -day operations are simply just different. Just one example, which you'll hear more about in other presentations from us, is that Kinder Morgan pigs its transmission pipelines much more infrequently than operators in the midstream segment pig their gathering pipelines. This is because the impurities in the gas have been removed at the gas plant and there's less occasion for liquids and debris buildup that would require pigging. Finally, another distinction is that Kinder Morgan's transmission pipelines are interstate pipelines, meaning the company moves natural gas across state lines in interstate commerce. This in turn means they are highly regulated by FERC. So prior to construction and operation of a transmission compressor station and its network of pipelines, Kinder Morgan typically must apply for and obtain a certificate from FERC, which involves an extensive process including consultation with stakeholders, environmental review under NEPA, project planning and revision, and redesign. It is a carefully calibrated process. Also, as a FERC-regulated operation, Kinder Morgan is then obligated to deliver natural gas to certain customers, and there are consequences for failure to do so. This makes sense because end users to Kinder Morgan's product in many cases are hospitals, schools, and general municipal operations. I'd like to next frame the discussion that we'll have over the next two weeks. The board's authority for this rulemaking, as we've heard, sources from New Mexico Revised Statute 7425, as revised by New Mexico Senate Bill 8 of 2021. By direction of the New Mexico legislature, 
the board is directed to address certain areas of the state exceeding the primary NACs for ozone by 95% by adopting rules to control emissions of NOx and VOCs. Consistent with this authority and direction, NMED took on the task of proposing this set of rules that is before us. These rules are intended to address ozone precursor pollutants, namely NOx and VOCs. Thus, it is the board's objective and within the board's authority to adopt reasonable regulations to mitigate potential NOx and VOC emissions from the oil and gas sector. Consistent with the scope of rule, Kinder Morgan conducted extensive analyses regarding the potential impact of the proposed NOx and VOC emission standards on their operations. And over the course of Kinder Morgan's technical testimony, you will hear a summary of those findings from Ms. Leslie Nolting, who is the Air Permitting and Compliance Manager for Kinder Morgan, from Mr. James Trent, who is a staff engineer from Kinder Morgan, and from Mr. Vince Brinley, who is a technical supervisor for Kinder Morgan. Finally, to further frame our discussions this week, we respectfully remind the board that its authority requires the board to take into account all facts and circumstances, including technical practicability and economic reasonableness of the proposed rules. While this statutory mandate, of course, permits the board to exercise its professional discretion regarding the weight to attribute to any particular fact or circumstance, by enumerating this list, the legislature made clear that of the facts and circumstances to be considered, technical practicability and economic reasonableness are priorities of the legislature. Furthermore, in matters of air quality regulation, it's the common and expected practice that the cost per ton of reductions of the regulated pollutant be evaluated. This is true for the department and other state and federal agencies. For example, as presented in the Kinder Morgan direct testimony, we researched several instances of agencies determining the appropriate and reasonable cost per ton threshold of a given regulation. This slide shows just a few of those cost ton evaluations. You'll see that in 2019, NMED determined that $7,000 per ton of NOx re reduced was an appropriate threshold for determining the cost and effectiveness of certain of the components of the regional Hays rulemaking. Pennsylvania, in turn, determined $3,750 per ton of NOx reduced was an appropriate threshold in the context of RACT analyses for major sources. This was also in 2019. While we recognize that determining whether a, cost, a certain cost is economically reasonable is not an exact science, a cost well over $7,000 per ton warrants significant scrutiny to be defensible. In order to evaluate the full impact of the proposed rules, Kinder Morgan conducted thorough, detailed, and individualized cost analyses to evaluate the cost effectiveness of the various proposed VOC and NOx standards as compared against the anticipated emission reductions. In Kinder Morgan's technical testimony this week, we will provide you with a summary of these analyses. In closing, I'd like to highlight for you Kinder Morgan's priority asks of the board, which you will hear more about in the coming presentations. On definitions, we ask that you adopt the definitions in the September 16th draft proposal that relate to transmission compressor stations. For engines and turbines, we ask that you adopt the tables 1, 2, and 3 of section 113 as proposed. We ask that you adopt the staggered compliance schedule set forth for turbines as proposed on September 16th. And we ask that you adopt workable alternate compliance options in particular to address circumstances of technical or cost and feasibility. In particular, we ask that you adopt the board section B10 and B11 of section 113 as proposed on September 16. For compressor seals, as we will discuss, it is not cost effective to control VOC emissions from wet seals at transmission compressor stations, and we ask that the board adopt the rule as proposed on September 16th. For leak detection, as we will present, we will ask for reasonable frequencies for transmission compressor stations and an opportunity to comply with the federal NSPS leak detection programs 
on all other LDAR requirements other than frequency to avoid competing programs that cause resource intensive challenges without emission reduction benefits. On the whole, Kinder Morgan supports reasonable regulation and we look forward to discussing with this with you over the next several weeks. That concludes my opening statement. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gutierrez. I'm going Let me to see if I can... um, change her all. All right. Um, we move then to a commercial disposal group. Uh, Mr. Newman, will you be making an opening statement? Thank you. Yes. Uh, good morning, uh, Madam Hearing Officer, Madam Chair, Board Members. I'm Chris Newman with the law firm Greenberg Trorig, and I represent the Commercial Disposal Group, which is made up of five entities, NGL Energy Partners, Solaris Water Midstream, OWL SWD Operating, Goodnight Midstream, and Three Bear Energy LLC. And some of our members are also members of Namoga, but as you'll hear, we are um, different in some fairly important ways in the assets and the operations that we have that are impacted by this rule. And we thought it was really important to explain those differences and why uh, in certain instances, some of the language and, and framework uh, in the new rule uh, might need to be adjusted um, uh, to make sense for for what we're doing. Uh, and in many cases that that has been done and we're very grateful. We appreciate the department's consideration of the comments and language that the group has proposed. Uh, in particular, uh, we're supportive of the changes to section 111 on applicability of uh, part 50. Uh, we believe that this change and others are gonna allow us to greatly streamline our witness testimony, which I'm sure many of you will be grateful for. And we hope to yield back much of the witness testimony time that we've reserved. I'd like to start by telling you a little bit about the commercial disposal group. Uh, as I mentioned, um, our issues are slightly different in, in pretty important ways. Each of our members has operations in New Mexico for the recycling and underground injection of produce water. Uh, most of the group have, facil uh, have facilities that operate produced water management units at which millions of barrels of produced water are recycled each year and returned to oil and gas producers for use in hydraulic fracturing and other reuse operations. Uh, these recycle ponds are several acres in size and often have the capacity um, to contain several hundred thousand barrels of water. Importantly, the, the water sent to these units uh, will have gone through pretreatment to remove oil and gas and thereby reduce emissions significantly. Uh, to date, the group has a total of 13 recycling facilities in New Mexico and several more in the planning stages. In 2020, group members recycled over 18.8 million barrels of water. And in the first six months of 2021, the group has recycled over 16.7 million barrels of water. You can see there's a significant increase and in the trend is for more recycling, which is, which is a good thing. If the produced water or brine water uh, at our facilities is not recycled by our group members, um, producers, our customers, will have to rely on, uh, more heavily on fresh water resources for their water needs. Um, produced water that is not recycled by our group is treated and then responsibly disposed at EPA underground injection control program uh, facilities administered by uh, the Oil Conservation Division. The Oil Conservation Division reports that since the legislature's passage of the Produced Water Act, 408 wells have been completed uh, using an average of just over 377,000 barrels of water each. And they report 55% of this water has been recycled produced water, um, which amounts to 85 million barrels of, of water that's recycled for this purpose. Although our facilities in some, in, in some aspects may look like typical exploration and production facilities, um, the operations and fluids at our facilities are much different. And consequently, the emissions profiles of these facilities 
are much different than uh, from those at production facilities. As I mentioned, the, the disposal well facilities receive produced water uh, from operators production and drilling operations, uh, but they don't uh, produce oil and gas. Um, our business is recycling water or disposing of water, not producing oil and gas at these uh, facilities. The produced water group members receive, um, receive low volatility, what we'll call post flash uh, water that has already gone through separation and processing and treatment at our customers' sites. Then at our facilities, the water is further separated from any remaining oil and that oil is trucked off site uh, to market. Um, the water is then either sent to a produced water management unit where it's recycled um, or it's injected into a, a UIC injection well uh, for disposal. The oil that um, we're able to separate at our facilities is also different than what you would expect at a typical production facility. It's less volatile and it's considered what we call dead oil because it has a limited uh, flashing or poten emission potential. A lot of those uh, troubling hydrocarbons have already been removed by the time it gets to us. Uh, because the initial language of the proposed rule <clears throat> was crafted to address important issues at uh, exploration and production facilities, we found that it didn't fit our unique operations at uh, commercial produced water disposal facilities. In many instances, it would have been technically infeasible or very expensive for us to implement. Uh, an additional concern was that parts of the proposed rule uh, might hinder further investment in or operation of important uh, water recycling efforts in New Mexico. The group identified difficulties it would face um, and offered testimony on several key areas, including um, equipment monitoring and transfer of ownership in section 112, hydrocarbon liquid transfers in section 120, pig launching and receiving in section 121, storage vessels in section 123, and of course, produced water management units in section 126. We proposed alternative rule language to uh, the department um, to achieve the goal of reducing ozone precursors, but giving members more flexibility in, in, in how to comply. And the department, uh, in many instances, um, considered and adopted parts of our proposals and others, uh, others were rejected. But in the final analysis, the group supports the latest proposed rule um, uh, as applied to its operations with really only a handful of exceptions on which we'll focus our testimony. So these remaining concerns would pr be presented through our uh, testifying witnesses. Uh, we generally support the proposed rule and our witnesses will adopt their um, written testimony and where there are still live issues that we'd like to address further, we'll offer a brief summary. On topics where we believe there's either been no further testimony or uh, through the September 16th um, revisions or otherwise the, you know, the matter seems fairly settled, uh, we intend only to adopt our written testimony and be available uh, for cross-examination. Um, not exactly sure how the the sur rebuttal and a testimony will proceed, but given our approach, if, if someone that comes after us has something important to say that we think might affect uh, matters on which we've testified, uh, if it's okay and you might consider, we'd, we'd like to raise our hand and perhaps be heard for a few brief moments uh, on those issues. We think they'll be very few and, and really, uh, rather than give lengthy summaries uh, to which no one might reply, I'd rather yield back our time and, and just address those issues as they might arise. And then briefly to summarize our witnesses, we have five witnesses who uh, again will focus on um, what few issues remain for our uh, concerns. Bill Kim is a senior air permitting engineer for NGL. Um, he's testified on section 120 hydrocarbon liquid transfer and section 123 storage vessels. Ashley Campsey uh, is a licensed professional engineer with 
Evergreen Environmental Engineering. And she has testified on Section 113 engine and turbine issues, Section 126 produced water management unit issues, and Section 112 um, monitoring uh, issues. Lori Marquez is a senior air quality consultant with BAR Engineering. And she's uh, testified on the logistical challenges and costs associated with uh, the Section 112 program. Uh, Greg Jones is an air compliance specialist with 3Bear, and focus of his testimony has been on Section 121 pig launching and receiving, where we do still have um, some concerns we'd like to raise. And lastly, Jill Cooper is a senior principal uh, with Geosyntec Consultants and has testified on um, Section 112 compliance evaluation issues, uh, which we would like to speak to. Section 123 storage vessels and Section 126 produced water management uh, units. Uh, so we'd like to thank the department again for listening to our thoughts and suggestions, the many they've adopted, and look forward to speaking to our remaining issues, hopefully in a very abbreviated way as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Newman. Uh, Ms. Witherspoon, uh, if you are on, I would invite you to um, uh, briefly summarize uh, what you will be encouraging the board to do when you make your presentation. Yes. Okay. Thank you, um, Madam Hearing Officer, Madam Chair, and members of the board. Uh, my name is Leslie Witherspoon, and I will be representing solar turbines. Um, we appreciate the opportunity to give technical testimony with respect to the co combustion turbine section of the rule. Um, solar turbines is largely in support of the September 16th, 21 version of the rule proposal, but we would like to take the opportunity during our testimony to make a few clarifying points and we look forward to presenting. Um, I will be the technical witness for solar turbines. I have 30 years of air quality experience. Um, a lot of air permitting and dispersion modeling experience, but for the last 23 years, I've been at solar supporting the placement of our turbines um, worldwide and, and been involved in countless rulemaking processes, specifically um, in the Pennsylvania General Permit 5 rule development process. Um, and the reason I mentioned that is that is the rule that New Mexico modeled the turbine section of this rule after. Um, so, um, I will be um, certainly um, available to, for, for um, questions um, if there are any um, from the board and others on, um, on why certain numbers are the way they are, because they do represent, for the most part, um, our turbines and um, because they are prevalent in the state of Pennsylvania also. Um, we have a large number of turbines installed in New Mexico and have um, a, a large number of the ones affected by this rule as we've been putting turbines in, in New Mexico for over 60 years. So that completes, that's, that's all I have to say today and I look forward to our testimony over the next, um, when we do that in the next two weeks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Witherspoon. All right. Um, I think, uh, oh, I, I did want to say Mr. Newman had mentioned uh, Sir Rebuttal, and I wanted to share with the board um, uh, a discussion that I had with council and party representatives last uh, Tuesday uh, in a second pre hearing conference. Um, I will invite Sir Rebuttal uh, after the parties have had a chance to do their direct and rebuttal. So rebuttal is not required to fit within that 30 minute uh, limitation on uh, technical witnesses. So rebuttal will be invited in reverse order uh, uh, from the um, uh, direct and rebuttal. And uh, the uh, department uh, reserves uh, the final spot there uh, as the uh, proponent of the rule. Uh, to address any server rebuttal uh, that uh, they haven't already addressed. Um, we can certainly talk more about that if you'd like when we get there. It's going to be a while before we get there. Uh, so let's break for lunch. Uh, we do have a one o'clock public comment period. And um, 
I don't know if these folks are on as attendees right now, but the first um, uh, the first four folks, so I'll, I'll just do four at a time. The first four folks I'll be inviting to offer uh, public comment are Sharon Wilson, Brent Stone King, Clinton Wiesenant, and John Alexander. Uh, so let's uh, reconvene at one. Thank you very much.